Andra's three decades of experience in international business and engaging with Asian tiger economies is the foundation upon which he adds value to all businesses wanting to engage with the Asian century. Currently helping businesses and professional bodies understand the intricacies of the geopolitics of trade in a region dominated by China. These insights are shared in his books, China's Belt Road Initiative, The Challenge for the Middle Kingdom Through a New Logistics Paradigm, and as a contributing author, Digital Transformation of Logistics, Chapter 13, Exploring the Digital Silk Road. Please welcome Andre as he shares his insights on digital supply chain with us today. Welcome back to our journey along the digital supply chain. You may recall in episode one, we took a look at the definitions and key concepts used. In this episode, we start taking a closer look at the critical issues. Now, in reality, a digital supply chain is meant to provide greater end-to-end -end visibility and transparency of all product and product flow along our supply chain. In recent times, it has become obvious that as that this is proving very problematic. And the reason for this problem has been the lack of universal data standards. Without data standards and a universal data standard, we cannot have effective data exchange and interoperability of our supply systems. And to discuss this today are three internationally renowned experts in the field. Janan Klepp is based in Australia, who sits on the international panel discussing and setting up digital twinning standards. Cameron Johnson, based in Shanghai and China, who has to deal with and overcome some of the issues when there's lack of data interoperability between Chinese-based systems and Western-based systems. And finally, Dr. Hanen Besha, who sits, who is vice chair for the Center for Trade Facilitation and in Electronic Business. Joining me this morning is Janani Clever, who represents Standards Australia on the IEC panel, creating the International Standard for Digital Twinning, that is responsible for defining digital twinning, digital engineering, digitization. She's also advising on a proposed new ARC Industrial Transformation Training Center and is an inaugural member of the Digital Twin Consortium. Janani is a recognized global authority on multi-domain interoperability, digital asset management, value chain, digital twin, and cyber physical systems. She is the founder and CEO of Digital Twin in Australia. So welcome, Janine. I am looking forward to our chat, particularly around some of the issues uh, which you are more than qualified to talk about. So Janine, where do you think we are at with regards to interoperability of systems and data standardization? For interoperability, um, with there's two ways of looking at interoperability for so that people can um, get their um, comprehension around what it actually means. Because there's interoperability with inside an organisation, and then there's interoperability where the organisations are actually then um, communicating via different systems with their either suppliers or their um, their customers. Now, with inside organisations, the interoperability is we will call it um, on a maturity scale of one to five, we're probably floating around one and two in terms of interoperability. A lot of the big um, computing houses like um, Oracle or Sapient, those sorts of houses have been um, investing quite a, a, a bit of energy in buying up all the different components that make up a business and then putting them into a platform, which means that the data can be shared. That has been, um, again, it's still, when you're talking about assets, it's actually still very naive in terms of where we actually are and where we need to be. There is an acceleration at the moment with um, the ability to inter make systems interoperable, but that, again, is also being diluted within organisations by saying what we'll do is we'll get... Um, 
uh, we'll just get these two little bits of data talking to each other, but we won't get the system talking to each other. And the difference between those two things I'll talk about a bit later on is actually um, worth monitoring and we need to be cautious about. When we then extend it to the external sort of supply chain rather than the internal value chain, what we're, what we're seeing is that um, whether it's an equipment manufacturer or whether it's a, um, a group, a consortium who come together um, and say, what we will do is we will all partner. And if you come and join us, then we will be able to share your data. In, that, in those environments, what's happening is that the control of the ownership of the data is actually being separated from, from the true owner. It is being shared amongst others. And whilst that sharing at this stage of maturity or our level of understanding around um, data might seem to be trustworthy, um, however, what, what, what it means and the thing that we need to be monitoring or need to be very aware of is that what we're doing is we're actually giving away our knitting when organisations are actually sharing that level or being that trustworthy with these consortiums. Because once you lose control of the data, you might own the asset, but you don't own the data. And when you don't own the data, you actually lose control of your asset. And I think that um, fundamental when it comes to supply chain is the thing that we are only starting to really learn about. So we're very immature. What are the ramifications for business of losing control or ownership of data that is collected via digital supply chains? Um, if I look at purely the, from, uh, from an asset perspective, what it means is that someone else is going to actually tell me um, how to maintain and look after my asset. So if we think about it in terms of a car, we think when we buy a new car, that's fabulous. Someone's going to tell me when it needs servicing. They're going to charge me a fixed rate and I can just deliver it and everything will be nice and I'm really happy about that. What the issue is, though, um, is that um, we might not actually have to pay what we're being asked to pay for to maintain our car or keep our car on the road. In fact, the cost of actually keeping our cars on the road is a fraction of what we're being charged. Only we have no knowledge of that. Now, if we're comfortable not to have any knowledge of that and accept what someone else tells me, then that's fine for that cohort of people who are like that. But if I'm a, um, an asset intensive business where my assets are actually the thing that generates my revenue, then I don't need someone else to tell me I actually need to understand that for myself because I need to control my own source of revenue. I can't really risk letting somebody else tell me what it's actually going to cost and therefore control my cost of deliverable. So competition becomes questionable. So I think we're, again, these two things are being, um, the tension is becoming much more obvious. I think it's easier. It has been quite easy for us to just use car examples or lawn mowing or all sorts of very kind of more domestic examples for people to explain to us how data is being shared and used and what the value might be but on a systems level or on a global scale, or when we're actually looking at our full supply chains, we're actually dealing with a very different argument. Janine, can you give an example of, of data standards and how they are applied in different settings, such as shipping? Right, so arrival of a vessel, um, I think, what, what I'm seeing, I've, I've got a couple of um, a port projects in play at the moment. And whilst I'm sitting on the, um, on the tarmac with the fixed assets at the moment, what we're doing is we're looking at receiving um, the information that's coming from ships, more, more from the last mile versus first mile. We're kind of in that sort of space. Um, and we're creating what we would call um, and what the industry is starting to understand as a cyber physical system. So what that means is that we have multiple systems within a precinct. So first mile, last mile would be described as a precinct where we have different owners, different assets, those sorts of things, if you like, coming in at one end, 
sort of sitting on a tarmac and being moved around or containerized. We've got different activities happening sort of on the wharf before it actually trains and trucks take it away. So we've got lots of owners and those owners have all got their own systems and those systems need to talk to us. So at the transaction level, and what I mean by that is um, um, ownership around uh, for insurance as we're moving um, containers off a ship Onto a, um, war, onto a wharf and then back out again, either being held or then being sent straight off, whatever it is. Those, what, that's what you would call in my world a transaction um, level. And this, uh, the blockchain, I think, is actually going to be a thing that will sort of sort that out. And that, again, is not a system. That is just the transaction from one, one item all, running all the way through. And I think that's what's going to dominate um, the port's if you like, or the shipping side of things for a while to come. However, once you actually, um, if we're looking at the fixed assets that are surrounding um, or within the port itself, and that when I talk about fixed assets, this is not just the wharf, this can be the straddles, the cranes, it's all that other equipment. It's also the sheds and um, we're dealing with layouts now around where um, containers would be sitting for one way reason or another, because as we all know, we can actually optimise how we move these containers around. Now, those assets are being, um, if you like, tracked or monitored using um, not just an RFID or a sensor within the actual container itself, but also for what's actually on the ground and the bollards that are being inserted to actually track the, some of that other sort of movement at more of a GPS level. Now, that type of um, assessment, because that's about if my product is going to sit somewhere, where is it sitting? Can I under, uh, identify where it's sitting? How many times it's been moved? Who's handling it? Which is different from a transaction level. This is just simply a physical level. Um, then that's actually very naive. It would appear that um, for that kind of movement and being able to track that kind of movement um, within a, a physical system, is um, uh, in Australia, we know that there are a couple of locations that are doing it. We know that overseas, there are there is a lot of talk about the ability to do that, but we're not actually seeing any evidence of it, of it happening. Where we're seeing, um, if you like, replicas or using um, a sort of a digital twin style to actually show um, the port in operation, that is more a rendered view rather than a digital view. So these are the sorts of things that tell us that it's actually not a database, but more of a photographic type view. The con where the data standards are coming from is work that's being done by the IEC and ISO globally. Um, and Australia is represented um, on that forum as are all the countries. Um, I represent Australia in that context, and I'm um, working on the digital twin, digital twin maturity, and now um, uh, this, the emergence of um, uh, defining what a cyber physical system is. Now, the thing in that that I think we all need to be aware of, um, particularly from Australia's perspective, is that it's dominated these, these working groups that are making these, defining these standards, are dominated by um, manufacturing, by academics, and by um, where the bulk of the manufacturing really is happening, which is in the Asian countries. And so the countries where you would expect, um, that where I would expect to see a lot more involvement, whether that be America, Europe, or um, uh, the UK, um, the involvement is actually quite limited. So what I mean by that is I turn up to um, working group meetings um, every month, and um, um, I might be the Australian there, and I'm battling to find anybody from any other country other than the Asian countries. And not that that's a problem, but it's a problem in as much as how, how do we know that we've actually got a balanced view on how, how, how this is actually going to impact trade? How is it going to impact the other commodities? So they're setting standards around what is a digital twin where you would have an autonomous system and every system would be autonomous. And yet in mining, where I spend a lot of my time and infrastructure, 
Um, we Autonomy is not an option. Complete autonomy is not an option because we talk about it as being humans will optimise the autonomy, which means, yes, we will control the robots or we will control how those supply chains on either end. So from a wharf, going back to our wharf, uh, you know, um, uh, robotic cranes and straddles, right? No people actually running those things, which is, you know, where everybody thinks is Nirvana and we need to be going. We actually need people who are, can actually manage and control those. And we need those people also to be dealing, um, I don't know, to be, they can be local, they can be re remote, but they still need to be local. We can't actually centralise it. And I'm working with people who think that they this should be centralised. So, i.e., a country could control that um, movement for all ports, if you like. And I say, no, you, I don't think that's actually a good thing. And yeah. there's not enough people, I, yeah. I think, yeah. saying, I don't think that's a good thing, right? Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. No, I agree with you. It's a very vexed question. But Janine, thank you for sharing your insights and, and the work that you're doing. It sounds like you are having a bit of fun and a, a bit of, <laughs> and, and a bit of exciting discussion. Thank you. And I good am. luck. Thank you, Andre. In the future. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Andre. Bye bye. Welcome back to, to the program and uh, look at the issues surrounding digital supply chains, in particular data interoper interoperability. And I'm very pleased to invite Cameron Johnson to have a chat around these issues. Now, Cameron is an author, a co-contributor with myself to a book called The Digital Transformation of Logistics. But more importantly, he's advisor to China's National RDC Industrial Technology and Innovation Strategic Alliance, which takes a look at data standards and particularly the interoperability of systems and data exchange. He's also based in Shanghai, which means he has on the ground solid feedback as to how supply chains are affected digitally between the West and China. So Cameron, in a sense, you are at the nexus at, at the flashpoint, so to speak, where two sets of standards are, are, in, are essentially coming up against, against each other. How do these differing standards affect the info and information exchange between, say, the Chinese systems built around the Belt and Road Initiative as with those built around West, the Western supply chains? That's a good question, Andre, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, so in terms of data, what we see really is two different things happening. One is where we talk about manufacturing data, right? ISO certification needed processes or documentation. That still seems to be okay. There still seems to be, you know, some ability to move that data from, let's say, China. You know, you're a supplier uh, in the States or Europe, and you need some kind of data for manufacturing, right? Quality control, what were the processes? 
that information is still going back and forth. But what we do see is a clampdown in China, um, just in terms of industrial production data, things that would be considered uh, very sensitive or critical to national security. That data is is no longer um, allowed or at least not really being able to move across borders. One example of this perfectly is we see the logistics data where you know, um, they would tell you where the ships are around the ports in the Shanghai, you know, in the Shanghai uh, or in the China zones of shipping. Those are now more or less blacked out. So we do see kind of a mixed bag at the moment. On the one hand, what we would call traditional, you know, production or supply chain data, you know, how many boxes of this product removed from you know, Shanghai, or we're moved from, let's say, Wuxi to Shanghai, and then on a ship to Shanghai to San Francisco, that data is still available and still being sent across borders because it's just part of the overall shipping information. But in terms of other more sensitive data, you know, at what time did it move? Um, what uh, particular products were in some of this, um, particularly if it's related to anything related to state-owned enterprises, all of that now, all of that data is being shut off and not being allowed to move outside of China. And is this proving to be disruptive to the supply chains? Uh, at the moment, it, again, it's a bit of a mixed bag. If you're dealing with anything with financing, right, money coming in out of the country, it's been very disruptive because, as you know, we have global systems. So let's say you're HSBC, you're Bank of America, right? Of course, you're sending money in and out because you have customers here, you have customers overseas. So data related to that uh, is actually now forbidden. You're, you have to silo data um, inside the country. Um, but on the other hand, if it's uh, data related to what we would consider normal shipping or logistics activities, at the moment, it, it doesn't seem to be affected. And what would the potential impact be on, 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 a, on a concept like blockchain, which requires a lot more openness, a lot more data to be shared, particularly financial information? Um, would, that be, 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 would that be affected by, the, uh, by, by China's sort of Clamping down? Will be. Um, how it will evolve, we don't know. One thing we have heard from the regulators, particularly the CAC, which is kind of the cybersecurity regulator who's gotten more power in the last 18 to 24 months, is that they are going to require um, all Chinese data to be uh, localized and basically siloed in China. So the best example of this is Didi, right? Where Didi, uh, when they tried to list overseas, uh, they were flagged by the regulators saying, listen, you have a lot of sensitive data. You know, we don't want the US or another company outside of China to have access to, hey, are there, what, who's dropping off who around government facilities or these kinds of other sensitive information. And so we are seeing a move closer and closer to basically a wholesale siloing where, you know, if you're outside of China, you'll have an Asia operations and an Asia data uh, platform or usage with information going back and forth. But inside China itself, it'll have to be siloed and you will not be able to move uh, raw data in and out. The one, again, ex exception, and this is going to watch this evolution, we are seeing the ability to do analysis on the data, right? So the raw data in its form cannot leave Chinese shores, quote unquote, but actually if you want to do analysis, um, reviews, uh, kind of see what we would call deep data um, reviews, you can actually still do that and send that information in a report form or some other form uh, overseas. That's uh, that's very interesting. I, I'd never heard of that, which uh, that's something to, to consider. Now, often when speaking about data standards and, 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 and interoperability of systems and data exchange, we get the feeling that in essence, the digital supply chain, the digital world, the global world, is, is splintering, is becoming bipolar in, in a sense, uh, a Chinese-based system entrenched within Chinese systems, and then a, a, a Western European type system, and, and the two don't really meet. Do you think that's happening? It is happening, um, although again, to varying degrees. I, I think the biggest uh, area we see it really is in new data and new technology standardization. And Andre, you and I have talked about this a lot where you know there is a Western system and there is a Chinese system. And so how do they, not only how do they operate, but who quote unquote sets the rules of the road. And so these are the two battlegrounds that we're seeing moving forward. Um, we do see particularly in things like new energy or industries of new energies, uh, new technologies, um, AI, that China wants to take a leadership role um, in a lot of that because they have a lot of uh, the, the information, a lot of the capability here. 
there's some pushback from the states in Europe, but I don't know necessarily if that's the if that's the right route to go. I think particularly, you know, China has a lot of dominant technologies in areas that most countries do not. And so the question is, how do we kind of we as a globe work together to sort out that uh, direction where everybody can jump on board? Do you, uh, one example of this again in the manufacturing. Sorry, go ahead, Andre. No, no, uh, sorry for interrupting. You go ahead. I was going to ask for an example, which you're about to give me. Well, yeah, sorry. Uh, one example would be in manufacturing, right? The ISO certifications, ISO 9001, ISO 9100, uh, the AS 9100C as an example in aerospace. These were all Western um, programs and certifications and processes that China implemented within its own system and now are considered more or less standard within the Chinese system. So I think, again, we have a bit of a precedence. Uh, the challenge for the West is understanding where can they push back on China and where can they need to work with China, right? China doesn't want to take over the world and everything, but they do definitely want to seat at the table, particularly for industries they're dominant in, such as I, robotics, um, you know, some of the newer industries where, where they, we still need to set a global rules setting standard. It's often argued that um, China, in a sense, is leading the the setting up of data standards and data capture standards uh, with the West lagging quite significantly well behind. Um, the question for me is whether the two systems in, in essence can operate side by side, as you mentioned earlier, silos, and whether we could create some form of uh, interchange between the two so that the systems became interoperable, making the, digi the, the digital supply chain a lot more visible. W would you agree with that? I, I do. I, I think, unfortunately, we're heading towards somewhat of a bifurcation of systems. Um, but I think at some point we're going to have to come back because the world is just too small. Uh, you know, the, the famous Disney song, It's a Small World After All, and it's definitely yeah. true, particularly with data and information. It just doesn't stay in one place, right? Everybody yeah. needs it. Everybody uses it. So yes, I think at some point, uh, even if we bifurcate, there will be systems uh, that will start to talk, that allow the different systems to talk to each other. And then whatever the new stage is, which there will be at some point, probably in the next you know, decade or two, there'll be a new platform. Then again, once people realize that the bifurcation doesn't really work very well, um, you know, where we're all kind of get on similar standards again. So it's gonna take an evolution and a process probably over the next decade or two to really hit that. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Cameron, for your insights. and. Uh... I'm looking forward to the ongoing discussion we have, particularly around the bifurcation of supply chains and what the new steps in the future will be. This topic, no doubt, will be visited on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you.
welcome back and uh, welcome Hannah Besha to, to the, dis the, the discussion on issues around digital supply chains. Hannah has a doctorate, a PhD in computer science and has been very involved in IoT smart containers. She's vice chair of the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. She's also very active with the DCSA, IATA, as well as the United Nations <clears throat> Economic Commission for Europe or EU. Welcome, Hannah. And uh, I'm looking forward to, the, to this discussion as you are very well in the thick of things with regards to the standardization as one of the biggest issues is data standardization. So where, where are we internationally with regards to data standardization? as it applies to digital supply chains and seamless integration. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for this nice uh, presentation. I think we have done uh, a lot in terms of standardization and we still uh, have a lot to do as well. This is my uh, short answer. For many years, the transport phase of supply chain has functioned primarily in a single or by mode of, uh, mode of transportation at, in silos. So we have this uh, single or by model, but closely aligned like road, air or road scheme. The data gaps between the trade contract and the transport contracts was not so critical since paperwork could be carried to identify the trade information. But over the past 20 years, it has been uh, not only possible, but more meaningful to move toward a more digitized world in order to protect the security and the safety of the supply chain and its participants. After 9-11, for example, the air sector moved more quickly in this direction first. Now, most customs authorities requires, require all the modes of transportation to report electronically. The world is now really moving forward more framework of constructed messaging of one, of course, or for data reporting. So when it comes to standards, the standard supply chain were quickly disrupted as well globally by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reliable single or by mode of transport silos were no longer enough to keep the trade goods flowing smoothly. So um, a usual combination of standards mode of transport were now considered and needed. For example, we are relying now on the road, sea, road, air. All private international standards working with this uh, are now engaged in the digitalization efforts and customs authorities as well are working with these organizations and adopting standardized semantics and business context, regardless of the mode of transport. So you see, even we have achieved a lot during the last decades. Still this uh, year, we did a lot of efforts due to the different uh, disruption factor. So uh, where we are is that the transport phase of supply chain is no longer being developed in silos for single or by uh, modes of transport. In terms of standardizations, standard organizations are now cooperating with one another to move toward operational and system interoperability in the supply chain. UNC fact, for example, in 2020 was requested by the main body of UN, the United Nations, how to identify and move goods in this disrupted world, regardless of the mode of transportation. So we call it the COVID-19 project. Compared, this project did compare uh, the primary data elements used by each of the primary mode of transport to see which elements are most commonly recognized in the transport phase, so that the trade goods can be identified and located to keep supply chain open and moving as quickly as possible. Unique identifiers have uh, been uh, recognized, although the same IDs have not been adopted by all mode of transportation. However, with the increasing demand and development and adoption of the API and new digital technologies advancements, previous gaps in the data are now envisioned to link together even if the IDs themselves are different. The data identifiers that have been adopted as a standards can now be utilized as long as they are identified in conjunction with their standards development body. The cooperation between the various standards body is key for future interoperability and more secure supply chain. Now, 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 in your discussion, you you spoke about the standards not being developed within data silos. Uh, are there any barriers that you, that that has been encountered in in getting people to participate and to share and to to really work towards building a common standard? I think in the transportation, the standard, like standardization sector. Sorry. I think in the shipping industry, there is, it's kind of, it's not really fast moving sector, so uh, a bit conservative, which means as long as it works, we don't really have to uh, change a lot of things. However, today we see with a lot of emerging data, uh, emerging um, data sources, a lot of technologies, and we see high expectations from the end users. So we are more and more uh, trying to in include more digital uh, streams 
to have more visibility and to offer better service in terms of at least the visibility to our customers. This is how, how, how it's moving. And we're trying to uh, work together, collaborate, share data in a simple standardized manner. And I think in terms of uh, 2022 has been really an extraordinary year in terms of landmark report and strategies to address global supply chain digitalization. So we have, for example, the, the digital um, data pipeline, which is basically a, a way to get different data sources and to be used by different stakeholders. This one way. We have seen as well um, the International Chamber of Commerce, for example, defining a toolkit for standardization, which is basically uh, creating rules, guidelines, and best practices to simplify and harmonize how trade and supply chain data are produced and exchanged machine to machine directly. So, for example, this toolkit could provide the starting point to guide users and their digitalization journey. And uh, I think all the supply chain actors leveraging now the same fun uh, foundational standards enabling more efficient sharing, reporting, and usability of high-quality reliable data. Same thing with uh, the World Economic Forum. We did develop a policy approaches to harness traders' digitalization. So it's really a more a framework, global legal recognition of electronic transactions and documents, um, global digital identities of persons and objects as well, one of the, let's say, the challenges that has been targeted this year, global interoperability of data, models for trade documents and platforms, global trade rules, access, and constitutional law. So all of these kinds of uh, organizations are really identifying the challenges and trying to work toward really resolving the current issue. Same thing with digitalization of, uh, digitalization of conformance and accreditation process. This is as well due to the rapid transition of global supply chain to data-driven digital streams. We are really placing now an increasing pressure uh, on the product conformity system, the relevance and the ability to deliver benefits through the international trade, income growth, and the economic uh, well-being of people. Do you think so really will... Please, yeah. Sorry, Hannah. Uh, just as you're speaking, the, the thought crosses my mind as to whether we will actually get to universal data standards for the digital supply chain, or would we still have to have some form of of, of, of API that will facilitate communication within different standards or different standard settings? I think when it comes to standards, it's, it's really moving target. So things are evolving, probably evolving um, faster now being the, 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 due to the particular context of this uh, two recent years. Okay. So are we fairly close to getting a, a, a common set of standards or do you see it still, in a sense, the holy grail that we are are slowly moving towards it, but there is still a lot of work to be done. We, we do have already standards. Until now, we do have, like, until now, we didn't work without standards. In fact, messages, uh, one form of standard. The core component library of UNC fact really covering the buy, ship, pay, it's well established and has been uh, working in complete almost for the last 20 years now. We are working on it and reaching it. So we really, we do have already international agreed recommendations, internationally agreed e-business standards, common libraries, common directories, code list. So it's not, we don't have standards until now, but as I said earlier, it's really a moving target. So whatever we have today, probably it's not uh, enough uh, to face the new challenges. Smart containers, IoT, um, different digital streams, the notion of um, data pipeline, uh, different APIs to subscribe to different messages. We really see emerging new technologies and we see that even the needs are uh, different. So uh, we, 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 and again, we do, we did uh, work based on standards. However, now it, things are really accelerating with these new emerging technologies, with the new challenges that you are facing in the world, as I said. Uh, so really today we are working to, 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 to make sure that we use the best of the technology. We catch up with all emerging technologies take advantage of the different digital streams, uh, emerging technologies to offer the best service, the best visibility and the most efficient uh, logistic chain. Now, these emerging technologies you're talking about, uh, could you give an example of, of one of them? Uh, IoT devices, smart containers. Now we are expecting all the vessels to be connected, all the containers to be smart. Uh, we are expecting to have uh, automatic um, Capturing of the different events, like the gate in, gate out, uh, from the port, from the vessels. We are, we are trying to have a new, uh, um, um, an efficient balancing of the empty containers worldwide. 
we are really looking into facing the good and not just the transport, even though the transport is a different service as it is today. We are really trying to bridge the gap between the different modes of transportation, bridging the gap between trade data and transport data. The users, they don't really care where is the container, they really care about where is the data, where is the goods, for example. So this kind of emerging technologies will enable us to have this uh, kind of continuous tracking of the goods and not necessarily of the assets on its own. Blockchain, we have been talked about a lot as well as your um, technology. So uh, it's really about having more visibility, more security, more reliable data, and having the capacity to take a well-informed decision using these different digital streams and taking advantage of the emerging uh, technologies. And it's, look, I, I really appreciate your contribution and your insights. It looks like a lot of progress has been made to facilitating standard standardization of data and capture, which will make digital supply chains going forward a lot more seamless and a lot more integrated. So Hanan, thank you very much and good luck on your journey. It sounds like you're gonna have a lot of fun over the next period. Thank Cheerio. you a lot, have a great day. I do hope you got some value out of this discussion today, particularly around the need for data standardization as we set up our digital supply chains. For a digital supply chain to be effective, we need data to be exchanged and we need interoperability of systems. Without data standardization, we cannot achieve this. It is pleasing to note that internationally, progress has been made. And I look forward to the day when we get truly end-to-end -end visibility and transparency of all product and product flow along our supply chains.